Uh, and here's another sort of big commercial application from uh, uh, one of the important contributors to the, uh, uh, the individuals involved in the uh, um, NIST uh, subgroup, requirement subgroup. That's disaster recovery. So disaster recovery is an important area, and clouds are wonderful for it. For it. In the example, this laptop I have here is backed up uh, on an ongoing basis to the cloud. And uh, since I've done that, I no longer take all these dreadful backups I used to take. And I no longer have lots of disks with lots of partial backups. Um, so, but more broadly and more um, thoroughly, one needs to actually have a backup plan and a, a disaster recovery plan for you know, the enterprise data. And that has to involve people, the processes, the technology, and also the overall governance, which involves security and privacy. Um, and we have actually replication and backup, and um, the data is uh, replicated every four hours, at least that's the estimate here. And uh, these data snapshots are retained for seven days. And the complexity, and so obviously um, this is a, there are many commercial companies having entries in this field. And as far as the classification of this applicate use case is concerned, is pleasingly parallel largely. Every file which has to be backed up can be backed up independently. So there is no, uh, there are no important global uh, Constructs is pleasingly parallel, and the parallelism is not actually over the data in some senses, over the files. Because nobody can, when you're doing the backup, it doesn't matter what's in your file. All that matters is there's a bit, is there are bits there. You don't have to interpret the bits. And you don't really get data until you have interpreted bits. Here's another simple example. Well, it's not actually a simple example, it's actually a very important example. Uh, we, will, we, have, well, we have highlighted the Internet of Things, noting that there are going to be 75 billion things on the Internet by 2020. And one important example is just the overall, the global uh, trucking and the uh, um, um, sending of um, light of, sorry, of, um, info, of document, uh, sorry, of, of purchases. Which FedEx, UPS, and DHL do. Uh, we, this was sort of had a lot of um, recent publicity at Christmas 2013 because the bad weather actually delayed all the delivery of, of the growing number of uh, purchases from uh, internet uh, stores. So this is pointing out that uh, this actual process can be monitored in a much more sophisticated fashion, a more active fashion. And you could have uh, things uh, sprinkled on, on the packages, um, on the sites where the packages are, so that any time you can find out exactly where your package is and where, where, whether it's got lost or not. And uh, there's a general picture on the following slide uh, showing how trucks are monitored and go between warehouses, and they have different modes of transportation. And uh, they have containers and pallets and other types of transportation units. And there are various standards involved here, because you have lots of different people producing packages and many shippers of packages. So this particular uh, diagram is, I think, futuristic, because although there's obviously a lot of use of uh, sensors, like an RFID and things like that, is still not possible, probably as sophisticated as it could be. Here we have a couple of use cases. One from a um, data point of view, and the next from a simulation point of view, covering materials. And the world is full of materials. So because you, when you manufacture something, you build it from materials. And as we go to 3D printing and everything, everybody's going to be manufacturing. We're going to be having personalized manufacturing. So and these materials obviously have very different properties. And 
as it says here, hundreds of billions of material decisions are made every year. But the actual adoption of a new material is a very time consuming process because it is not automated and not very well supported by, by um, <coughs> technology. So we can talk about the materials genome, which is sort of the idea is that the list of all materials can be it can be electronic, electronicized and um, made in a much more sophisticated fashion. And um, also we can have the repositories of materials and the repositories of materials data which support discovery. The claim is the current approach is necessarily a very conservative because the data is very uh, poorly organized and very difficult to make reliable decisions. And another aspect which we'll come back to in the next use case is simulations can be important in, in enhancing our knowledge about materials. So the, in the future, the expectation is that these simulations will actually become more important. And just as we do drugs by a combination of a, a simulation and experiment, we're going to do materials by a combination of simulation and experiment. And there have to be standards to allow the different stakeholders to talk to each other. And we have need to have proper procedures, proper databases, which may or may not be SQL or NoSQL. And um, we need to have, be able to visualize these materials and um, make good decisions. So this is pointing out that manufacturing is going to be potentially revolutionized by building the material, the digital material genome. So examples could be uh, materials for ba making batteries. And there's a lot of effort, in the, especially in the Department of Energy, to do massive simulations to look at the light spaces of design. And uh, you can look at the, uh, just a simulation in the aerospace industry allowed you to just go over many possible ideas for the design of a wing. Simulations in the materials world can go over many different choices for complex materials. So in here, and here we have the um, actual um, software used. Uh, the one I know best is NWKIM, which is uh, a very large simu simulation uh, developed within the Department of Energy, especially at uh, Pacific Northwest Labs. Um, and they actually use pretty ingenious early parallelization technology, so it's a very well known package. And those run on supercomputers and those produce the results which get fed into the genome, the material genome repository. And then you're going to need to do machine learning and build knowledge systems that integrate data from publications, experiments, and simulations to support materials. Now, I note in the corresponding biology case, it's already well known and the same is true, that you can get results not only from measurement, but also actually from analyzing papers. Because so many papers are um, published, and there are too many for any one person to look at. So you can actually need to mine papers automatically. And those papers are sort of labeled by the name of the substances, and the same with uh, materials. Those papers on materials are labeled by the the things that materials are composed of, so you can actually do a very thoughtful analysis through the uh, such an analysis of um, of existing data, surveying um, existing data. So we have here um, uh, a new category, HPC, which is uh, just high performance computing and um, we will find other examples of that later on. This this field, like the other examples, like when we do say astronomy, we have high performance computing to predict the uh, makeup of stars and then how they evolve through galaxies. And we also have observation of stars and galaxies. In this case here with materials, we have simulations of materials and data on materials coming from experimental observation. It's worth noticing that the simulations actually are also paralyzed. Um, the simulations, uh, like in the material, the material is a three dimensional object. You take the space occupied by the material, divide it up into a bunch of mesh points, 
char characterize, say, the uh, density of the material or the polarization of the material or the particular fractional makeup in terms of, uh, of its uh, com component parts. And then you uh, do the parallelization over the mesh points with these uh, characteristics. And um, we end up with a huge database of material properties, and we will also get parallelism over that database. So that's the end of the commercial applications. You notice that the last one was actually a mix of sort of research, the simulation of materials, and commercial. Um, so that's uh, the end of that particular lesson. Thank you very much.